Hello, welcome. You're watching BBC News live from Cardiff as King Charles III makes his first visit to Wales as the new monarch. Welcome to viewers in the UK and around the world. King Charles says the country held a special place in his mother's heart as he addressed a remembrance event at the Zenith. The land of Wales could not have been closer to my mother's heart. Roithle Arbenig i Gymru yn i chalon. In central London, thousands are continuing to join the queue in order to pass by the Queen's coffin. And that's despite authorities closing the gates to Southwark Park for a period early this morning. They said it had reached capacity. And I'm Karen Ginoni with those crowds of people waiting to pay their respects to the late Queen as she lies in state in Westminster Hall. The Queen's children, including King Charles, will be keeping a vigil over her coffin this evening. I'm Martine Croxall here in the studio. I'll be speaking to a former press officer to the Queen for his thoughts as the nation continues to pay tribute. Hello and welcome to Cardiff. Welcome to the Senate, where it was just a short time ago that there was about a thousand people here standing in glorious sunshine and welcoming the new king, King Charles III and the Queen Consort as they visited the Senate. It was completely calm, quiet and still as everyone turned to watch the big screens when King Charles addressed the Parliament, not just in English but also in Welsh, a hugely symbolic moment for people here to hear the King speaking Welsh so fluently and talking about his mother, his memories of uh, his time here in Wales and what this country meant to him and to the royal family. And when he left, there were lots of cheers. There were a, a, a few people here who uh, were not happy that the new King was here, but they were quickly drowned out by cheers of approval from people who were in the crowd. And now he has gone to Cardiff Castle, where about 2,000 members of the public will be able to see him and meet with him uh, later this afternoon. Let's just uh, show you some pictures that we have from inside the castle where you can see events that are now underway there. And also uh, we can show you pictures too from central London because while there are activities here in Cardiff today in London, uh, the queue to see the Queen lying in state we understand has still been paused after Southwark Park which is at the very end of the queue reached capacity and it is many kilometres long now the queue about eight kilometres long. Uh, we now have also heard that it has been confirmed that at the King's request, both Princes William and Harry will be in uniform when they take part in a vigil beside the Queen's coffin on Saturday evening. And the King and his siblings will hold a similar vigil at the Queen's lying in state this evening. That is where King Charles will be headed to after he has had his event at Cardiff Castle. But to bring you back here to Wales, let's just take you through the events of today. And there were crowds of cheering well-wishers lining the street here in Cardiff to greet King Charles and the Queen Consort, particularly first thing this morning when they went to Clandaff Cathedral, arriving there for a service of remembrance. And in his address, the Archbishop of Wales said the Queen had graced the life of Wales with love, dignity and courage. Prayers were said by faith leaders, including speakers from the Jewish and the Muslim communities. And then they headed here to the Senate, where they heard condolences from the First Minister, Mark Drayford, and other party leaders, members of the Welsh Parliament as well. And he spoke, as I mentioned, in both English and Welsh, alternating, vowing to follow the selfless example of the Queen. And he also expressed his gratitude to the Welsh people. I am deeply grateful for the addresses of condolence, which so movingly paid tribute to our late sovereign, my beloved mother, the Queen. Gun a bead seneth of fobble Cymru and hrani fun ristuch. Through all the years of her reign, the land of Wales could not have been closer to my mother's heart. 
roedd slae ar benig i Gymru yn ei chalon. Well, after that address, he came down the steps of the Senate and we weren't sure if he was going to come and greet the crowds who've been waiting here in the sunshine for a few hours. Uh, but when he did, there was a, a ripple of applause. He has been meeting with the crowds wherever he goes. In this instance, this morning, he not only shook hands, he actually managed to fist bump with someone in the crowd who was completely thrilled. Uh, it was a lovely thing to see and there was a huge amount of support for him amongst all the people who were gathered here before he then made his way to Cardiff Castle. And let's take you there to inside the castle where we can join uh, Jennifer Jones, who is with the crowds. Jennifer, how's the atmosphere there? Well, there's uh, an atmosphere of anticipation and excitement because King Charles III and his Queen Consort are still here. They're inside the castle apartments behind me and there are hundreds of people here still waiting to catch a glimpse of them as they leave and perhaps be the second person to fist bump with the new king as he uh, walks around and chats to people. Let's get some thoughts on today's events with our news correspondent Hugh Thomas, an historic day in Cardiff. Absolutely. I think from the start, seeing the arrival in Llandaf Cathedral, the service there, uh, but also in the Senedd, the significance of King Charles speaking Welsh in the Senedd and those pictures being beamed around the world can't really be understated, overstated, because he is a monarch now, but he learnt Welsh as a young Prince of Wales, and he has dropped it in here and there over the years. That's probably the most we've heard him speak Welsh in, in, in recent times. Um, so that's a significant moment in itself. But also to come to the castle now, to meet people here, uh, to have private audiences, audiences with the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, and with the, with the presiding officer, of the Senate. So that a chance there for a private discussion, confidential one, or one you hope where uh, they will discuss that future relationship that the King will have with Wales, having had such a close one as Prince of Wales up until last week. Mm -hmm. And over the past 60 years, he's immersed himself in Welsh culture, the language, and has got to know the people. He has. It's not always been a great uh, relationship in terms of the, the popularity that he's, in, he's, he's enjoyed. A hint of protest today as well, and he's had to face that over the years too. Um, but also he's managed to really immerse himself with key organisations here, places like the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, where he sponsors some of the students, but where he also attends board meetings, where he gets hands-on, where he follows up, he has a very close relationship, he will write, he will expect decisions, expect changes, expect to know how these organisations are adapting and, and expanding. Likewise, a lot of them have been turning to him for help. It's when charities or individuals have been trying to progress their own businesses, their own causes. They'll ask the prince, what advice can he give? What are the organisations that he's involved with? How can they help? That's formed lots of close bonds over the years. Now, inside, he's meeting those people. I don't know if it'll come up, but a lot of them might be wondering, where does that relationship go next? Does it continue with the king? Or will William, now Prince of Wales, take up those reins? So, in uh, 2008, he took uh, possession of the Llwynawel estate in Motherwy, which is in Carmarthenshire, just on the outskirts of the Brecon Beacons. We know that he likes spending time there, getting away from it all. He spends Wales Week there every year, doesn't mm. he? I mean, he won't be able to spend as much time there in future. No, and this Stoina uh, Wermod, it's an estate, but you wouldn't know it was there. You know, it's a place of real sanctuary. He went there after the Duke of Edinburgh died last year to escape the attention. It's a place you can escape to. It's also a place that he uses and has used regularly for big functions. I was there in July this year where he had students, acting students, performing for him. But also there were other uh, ambassadors from China, from Italy, from the Netherlands who had come to rural Carmarthenshire for, for an evening with the Prince of Wales at his Welsh house. Um, the soft power of that is particularly useful to those Welsh organisations who benefit from the relationship that they had with the then Prince of Wales. But certainly he managed to get himself a home, which he said he'd spent 40 years looking for the right spot. He's got that in Wales. It may still be useful to him as king, but also whether William will, will take, uh, if not possession of that home, but at least be able to use it and use it to the extent that Charles has used it as well. And he's really championed Welsh culture and music, hasn't he? In 2000, he uh, reinstated that title of uh, official harpist to the Prince of Wales and Catherine Finch was his first. Yeah, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about royal traditions and the, the good ones and the bad ones. You can argue that he's done an awful lot uh, for, for harp music, but also for that royal tradition of sponsoring uh, a harpist uh, in Wales. Catherine Finch is arguably the most 
most famous harpist in the world at this point. Um, certainly being associated with the, with the Prince of Wales at that time uh, would have helped that, that, that early years of her career. But also it's a process by which so many harpists are able to, uh, to, to earn um, not just the respect of, of the Prince of Wales, but also that they can get, get they can perform in all sorts of places uh, and be really a real part of your big events like today at, at the Llandaff Cathedral. So certainly his role in, in promoting the culture of Wales has been crucial. OK, Hu, thank you very much. Well, let's head uh, back to the Senedd and uh, Lucy, who is in Cardiff Bay. Jennifer, thank you so much. The Queen came to Wales 300 times. She visited every corner of this land and there were people sharing their memories uh, this morning of the Queen, but also very much looking ahead with a sense of anticipation to the reign of King Charles. So let's take you over now to Sharon Preet-Kyra, who is in the crowds at Cardiff Castle. And I wonder what their feeling is about the new King, what they're looking forward to about his reign, Sharon Preet. Well, Lucy, I'm in the heart of that crowd at Cardiff Castle, and I think people, more than anything, just want to catch a glimpse of the new king. People have travelled from far and wide. I met a couple who'd been in the queue since quarter to five and had travelled all the way from Switzerland. Now, some members of this crowd have even dressed up for the occasion. Ladies, tell me about your outfits. Um, well, my outfit actually, Charles is actually honoured because this is normally only worn on rugby days. So I put it on today for Charles and I hope he likes the crowns as well. Should we tell you the story about the crowns? Please do. We went to a local um, burger establishment where they had these crowns. So I got one for all my friends. And I understand that the three of you just met in the queue, is that right? That's quite correct. Yeah. I did know these been ladies firm before. friends since we've been in the queue. Yeah. <laughs> So tell me about the atmosphere. A lot of people would have been watching this from home, wouldn't have been able to come themselves. So paint the picture for them. What's it been like this morning? It's been absolutely amazing. Everybody's in a really good spirit. They're all very, very friendly. Um, lots of smiles, lots of welcoming. It's, it's really, really nice. Wales has put on a, a real good show for our new king. And of course, King Charles III is currently in the castle buildings. He's meeting a number of charities. He's meeting the First Minister. What do you think people, what do you think it will be like for the people at the front of the queue who do get to meet him? Oh, amazing. I mean, we just didn't get here early enough. We were here about 10 o'clock this morning, but no, we, no way we can get to the front. But good luck to those who do. I'd like to meet him and give him a crown. <laughs> and I understand you've brought a gift for him too. Well, for the Queen, really. Um, I picked this heather yesterday in Epicumbra, off Minith Main. Welsh heather for a fabulous Queen <laughs> and King. That's completely, that's, that's quite all right. Well, thank you so much, ladies. And I hope you do get your, your glimpse of King Charles III when he comes through. Now, around 2,000 people have been allowed into Cardiff Castle for this event. One of the lucky few is Celia. Celine. Celine. Celine, 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 tell me, what do you think King Charles III will be like? I think he'll be a good king, try his hardest to make everybody happy. And what have you seen so far today, Celine? Have you seen the pony? Have you seen the goat? I've seen the goat, I've seen King Charles and Camilla and I've seen Mark Drakeford. That's absolutely brilliant, thank you so much. Now a number of people have also chosen to line the streets outside the castle to catch their glimpse of the King as he leaves and when he came in earlier on this historic first trip to Wales. Back to you Lucy at the Senneth. Sharon Preet, thank you so much. Well, let's return to that historic moment of the Senate when King Charles addressed the parliamentarians who were there and everyone was watching on big screens outside. Because I don't think it can be overstated just how symbolic it felt that King Charles addressed parliamentarians in both English 
and in Welsh. They are both uh, national languages, of course. And watching that with us was Sam Blacksford, who is a Welsh historian at UCL. Very good to see you, Sam. What did you think of the address that King Charles made and some of the references in his speech as well? I thought the references to the princes, the, the medieval princes, was, was really interesting. And that is medieval history. We're going back a long way there. This is post the Norman Conquest, you know, post 1066 and all that, where you've got Welsh people essentially being essentially being colonised by by English kind of um, invaders, and that is a very serious thing that a lot of Welsh nationalists still feel very strongly about now. What's interesting is that since then, you know, since kind of the 1500s with the Acts of Union and all the way through the Industrial Revolution, I mean, the, the first million pound cheque was actually signed a stone's throw away from here where we are in Cardiff Bay. You know, Wales and Welsh people have played a very kind of integral role in Britain, in the Empire even, in the World Wars, and yet Charles still feels, sorry, the King still feels like he has to refer back to the sort of the medieval past. So he thinks it's significant enough. He knows that there is criticism enough from, from from sort of nationalists currently to warrant saying something about that. So I think that is very, very significant indeed. The relationship between the monarchy and the Welsh people was described to me earlier today as being complicated. Is that a word you would use as well? Well, it depends who you're talking to. I mean, for some people, it's certainly very complicated. For some people, they just simply dislike the monarchy and think that Wales, with its, you know, quite new parliament and its kind of modern, fresh sense of identity shouldn't have a monarchy and that the monarchy is a very English figure or the monarch is a very English figure. The reality is that the vast majority of people in Wales do see themselves in some sort of way as both Welsh and British. There's a dual identity and because the monarch is the head of the British state, they, they, they see that as reasonably kind of a comfortable idea. And you see the way the crowds acted here today. Okay, this is, this is probably not representative of the Welsh population, the people who turned up here in Cardiff Bay today. But there is broadly, I think, a, a sense of warmth for not just for Queen Elizabeth II, but for the new king. And I think the way that he's kind of going to play it, building on his reputation of the Prince of Wales, and I'm sure that they will on the whole, carry on accepting that, that this is a reasonable setup for a head of state. Was there a sense of surprise at all here in Wales, though, at the timing when King Charles said that Prince William would become the Prince of Wales so quickly? Um, I, I, my sense was that there was some surprise from some quarters, yes, but then also this is a uh, hereditary monarchy it's a kind of it's very hierarchical the fact that um, williams inherited some of his father's titles isn't a huge surprise it took a while for charles to be named the prince of wales back in the day and for his investiture to happen but that's because he was so young now explain the controversy around the investiture in 1969 so um it was announced in 1958 that Charles would become Prince of Wales when he was an adult. Now, the, the whole idea about a Prince of Wales is a complicated one related to that thing I was saying about medieval monarchs and that idea of Wales being a colony of England. So there, there, there was some controversy, and actually around the investiture in 1969, there was a bombing campaign. You know, there was a, quite, a, quite a small but a very significant bombing campaign to try and disrupt the activities um, around Charles going to Carnarvon Castle, which is in northwest Wales, um, you know, standing in front of his mother, having a crown placed on his head. And there were, you know, very famous protest songs written about it. But ultimately, again, I think this is, to some extent, a, a vocal minority thing, a little bit like we have now. There were, there were plenty of people, even sort of people up in northwest Wales who are very Welsh-speaking, very sort of clear about the sense of Welshness, who loved the investiture, were very keen on all of it and supported it and cheered for Charles when he, when he turned up then. Nonetheless, does this mean very careful consideration will have to be made as to whether we will see another investiture? I highly suspect it would be a very different kind of investiture. It will not have all the pomp, the ceremony, the circumstance that Charles has had in Carnarvon. The thing with the monarchy, I think, which is really crucial, is that you can't make it all kind of bland and bureaucratic. If William is made the Prince of Wales here, say, for example, in this very modern building, then does it just feel like a new political process? Does it just feel like a, a very uh, typical, grey, political stunt? Whereas what we actually like about monarchy, or what some people like about monarchy, is the unusualness of it, the, the, the horns, the, the, the anthems, pageantry. the pageantry, the circumstance, the, 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 the ceremony. That's why a lot of people turn up for it. It, it just adds a bit of a splash of colour. And I think that William is, is very effective at being a sort of a modern monarch. You know, he's a, he's a very typical kind of father figure. He's quite, he's quite sort of ordinary in some ways, and he won't want something that seems too out of the ordinary. But at the end of the day, the monarchy is very extraordinary by its very nature. It is the very top of, our, of a hierarchical system. It, it, is, it is where the head of state is from. And without that pageantry, like you say, then it's going to lose kind of, I think, the aura that really makes it special. So it's going to be a very fine line. It's going to be a very difficult fine line for them to tread about, not, not doing something that looks imperial or colonial, but also doing something that looks special. 
So it's important for him, do you think, to carve out a sort of different role as the Prince of Wales, perhaps even a more visible role, because that's what society expects now, particularly so. in this age of social media, I, when every movement is captured. I think so, and also to emote a little bit more. You know, he and his wife are quite good at relating to people. And what I find really interesting about King Charles now is the way that he is doing more walkabouts, he's doing more handshaking with ordinary people. That is, a, that is a different approach to what his mother did. He is still carrying on with lots of the ways that she did things. There is an element of continuity here, but there is also elements of difference. A very quick final question, mm. Sam. What does he do about the football? Who does he support? <laughs> You're, asking the wrong <laughs> You're asking the wrong person when it comes to football. I would imagine that he can say, as the, as the head of state, he's rooting for them, rooting for rooting them both. Rooting for both, yeah. yes. He's head of the English <laughs> FA, but now the Prince of Wales, and they are facing yes. each other in the World Cup. A very difficult decision for him, and I think one that everyone is going to ask him about in the days to come as we lead up to Qatar and the World Cup. Well, let's just take you back to Jennifer now, who is still inside Cardiff Castle. Jennifer. Well, Lucy, we've just been listening to the regimental band of the Royal Welsh. They've been playing Welsh hymns and also more familiar classical music. It's quite moving to be here. I'm just uh, still talking to our news correspondent, Hugh Thomas, and we're expecting uh, King Charles III and the Queen Consort to exit the castle apartments any minute now. Yeah, they're going to come out and they're going to have another one of those walkabouts, um, which have gone so well so far uh, today. We know that um, when he does come out, it's going to be um, an opportunity to, to shake hands, to meet people here. Um, but also that he is being very well received. I mean, he does this when he comes for um, his, uh, when he came here as Prince of Wales. He was in uh, the Ronda a few weeks ago. Over a thousand people on the streets there as he toured the high street, um, getting a, you know the kind of reception that people had probably forgotten about that he would get those sort of crowds. You know, um, it hasn't always been a, um, a relationship where you'd expect um, big crowds to be able to come out cheering, but they have today, and we, we've seen that here in the castle as well as outside on the street. And uh, we can see pictures of him now just saying uh, a few words to those representatives of charities and civic leaders. Uh, just remind us, oh, I think that's uh, Mark Drake for the yeah, First Minister. Yeah, he's with the there. First Minister, Mark Drakeford, there, and that crucial first private audience today. There isn't a formal relationship in terms of the audiences that he has with the First Minister of Wales, but they met in July when he was Prince of Wales. Um, he does keep in touch. He does maintain that relationship, and you would expect that to continue now that he's king, even if there's not the sort of weekly formality of uh, the audiences that he has with the Prime Minister. Um, and these are th those representatives of those key organisations uh, that he's been involved with as Prince of Wales and will probably want to keep those relationships going as well now that he's king. Um, certainly the, the, the role that he has uh, has changed and it really remains to be seen how much of the formality of, of Welsh or public life he wants to a gift to William now that he's Prince of Wales. Um, but um, you would imagine that having spent 60, you know, nearly 50, nearly 60 years being Prince of Wales, he at least would, would want to, to keep those connections going because he's made such a, a, a strong impact on those people and, uh, you know, and really has taken an own uh, keen personal interest in how they, how they do and what they're up to because he's constantly checking in with them. Um, and if he's not, his private office uh, are doing that as well. Um, you know, I mentioned places like the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. There are others too, you know, um, big projects. Um, for instance, when Swansea University was expanding its campus, um, the Prince's Foundation was involved in the discussions about how to do that um, and how to do it you know, to, to the design specifications, which are world class. Um, the Prince of Wales was key in getting a lot of that sort of stuff moving. Um, he's also you know, taken interest in heritage, places like the castles of Wales, which for so long were you know, are still connected with you know, the conquest of Wales by the English monarch. Uh, now they're places of heritage and, and culture, and the restoration and upkeep of, of castles um, are one of his main priorities when he, when he comes here. Um, you know, he's, he's somebody who, who wants to be involved, wants to get stuff done, um, and this is kind of his opportunity now to, to meet up with some of those people. We know that um, people like the Vice Chancellor of the University of Wales, uh, Trinity St. David, uh, Medwin Hughes is someone who he's been meeting inside the castle today in one of these sort of horseshoe groups. I think that's him just to the left of him in the picture at the moment. Um, these are the types of connections he's had are with you know, academia, um, heritage, architecture, conservation. 
the areas that he's known to be interested in that we've heard him talk about um, from the point of uh, view of being having fairly sort of advanced views on these things 30 years ago which are now totally mainstream um, and he's been pursuing those causes in Wales and been able to do that um, pretty well almost with a behind the scenes role uh, when, he, when he's been coming here. Um, but certainly today, that's his opportunity to, um, to meet up with some of those people. But lots of them, I suspect, wondering how close that relationship can be with the king as he moves into those different duties, those many more responsibilities. And today, Hugh, has felt like a reminder of how Wales has changed so significantly since Prince Charles's investiture at Carnarvon Castle in 1969. Of course, we didn't have a Senna. This is pre-devolution, and now he's holding private audiences with the First Minister. It's a very different Wales in 2022. It's very different. In some way, the wheels of monarchy haven't moved as quickly as uh, the wheels of Welsh public life. Um, things like the announcement about there being a new Prince of Wales coming so quickly into his reign took a lot of people by surprise, I think not least the Welsh Government. This idea of um, monarchy still being able to make announcements like that which affect Welsh public life without there needing to be you know a very public discussion debate consultation even um, you know that, that those are the, the the occasions where there may be a, a slight jarring of the relationship um, but it, 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 he also sees it as his role uh, to neutralize that a bit as well and he will have hoped to have done that today you know in, in terms of the speech in the Senev referencing uh, Thuelin ap Griffith who you know is considered to be the last native Welsh Prince of Wales Llywelyn in Llywolaf, our last leader is how he's referred to in Wales. Um, what he did today was place himself in that long tradition of Princes of Wales and now has placed William into that, what he sees as that lineage as well, um, trying to uh, at least reference and, and hold on to the past while saying this is our new face and this is, uh, we hope you will accept him. Um, you know, it is a matter of, of public debate in Wales at the moment as to how much William will be uh, accepted and what his role will be. So I would, I would suspect in the coming weeks we may hear more from uh, the palace about uh, William's role and, you know, the slightly thorny issue of whether there would be an investiture as well uh, of any kind, let alone on the scale of what happened in 1969. Some people in Wales were quite surprised with the speed at which uh, the new king announced that his son William would be Prince of Wales. But of course, Prince William and his wife Catherine lived on Anglesey for nearly three years. Yeah, William has lived in Wales far longer than Charles ever lived in Wales. Um, his roots, if you like, are already slightly deeper, uh, at least in, in conventional Welsh life, if not in, uh, in the public life and the institutions uh, like his father has managed to establish over the years. Um, it'll be for William to show what sort of Prince of Wales he will be and also how much discussion there'll be about you know, the patronages he might take on, the organisations he may be involved with. There certainly hasn't been anything close to a transition. Um, the all the discussions I've had over the last year, 18 months, while I've been researching this, is that there wasn't going to be any discussion about what comes next until that next thing happened. Um, now that it has happened, um, you suspect that there will be a lot more talk if there isn't already a plan. Uh, at the moment, William is you know, patron of the Welsh Rugby Union, um, and whether he will take on other patronages, um, you know, people have, have said to me, well, maybe he has a role in you know, the great outdoors, national parks. Uh, where are the areas that he has a personal interest that he will uh, progress those in Wales? And perhaps those areas which already have great support from the king uh, from his time as Prince of Wales, how many of those does he really want to take on and pursue? Or does he want to carve out a role uh, which is unique and which, which says William is Prince of Wales and this is what he stands for? You know, in Wales, Charles is the only Prince of Wales any of us have known, um, and he has been the longest serving, and he has been the only modern Prince of Wales who's had to adapt to all the focus and attention that, that, that came with that. Um, you know, William is entering it as a, as a man who is 40 years old, has a family, has an, a public identity already, um, but now needs to really, I don't know if you'd say whether he needs to Welshify that, but, he, but something needs to happen which shows um, how he will be Prince of Wales uh, when the time comes. And you mentioned earlier here, there is 
a bit of a national debate going on in Wales. I'm sure that will intensify over the next weeks and months as to any potential investiture, like you mentioned. It's unlikely, isn't it, that we would see anything on the scale of that investiture in yeah. Carnarvon in 1969. And some have suggested it could even take place in the Senedd or have some kind of yeah. other... Or here at Cardiff setting. Castle. I mean, that's the thing that, which is suggested to me a couple of times was if it happens at all, it'll be small scale. It'll be in Cardiff and it may be in Cardiff Castle or in the Senate. The risk is that the Senate is a political stage for that to happen, whereas the, the sense is that it, they do not want it to be a, uh, it be pursued to be, uh, perceived to be a political uh, position. Um, clearly, you were seeing the king there with uh, Mark Drakeford, the first minister, um, inside the castle and about to emerge in the next uh, minute or so. Um, you know, today, the, the focus is on the king's links with Wales and that meeting he's held with the First Minister. And I don't think we will get much of a sense of what was discussed, um, but it'll be interesting to see whether the types of meetings he's had today will be uh, something which reoccurs. Or is this a one-off because of their focus on Wales today, or will he want to maintain uh, links with um, this Welsh First Minister, but you know, First Minister from the other, other devolved nations as well, as well as his... his his traditional role of meeting the Prime Minister. And uh, Wales is, of course, the last devolved nation to receive a visit from the new king uh, since the death of Queen Elizabeth. And he does seem particularly relaxed here and keen to talk to people, keen to get to know people better. Yeah, he is very relaxed here. I think we see that when he was here as Prince of Wales and his, 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 his sense of uh, wanting to be as at home in these sort of civic environments as he is when he's visiting farmers and, and visiting the, the national parks and being able to get hands on as well. And Wales offers him um, a bit of a sanctuary away from, from London life. You wonder whether he'll be able to uh, enjoy it as much as King, uh, but certainly we're seeing that relaxed approach today when he's been meeting the dignitaries, but hopefully we'll see it as well when he comes out because certainly you know, the numbers here um, have stuck it out. They came in much earlier on today uh, in the hope of seeing him. Um, they've had to hang on now while he's been inside holding all of those, those private meetings. Uh -huh. Well, I spoke to someone earlier who'd caught the 4.55 train from Swansea to get here on time. They were yeah. very excited. I'm sure they're still here yes. in the crowd waiting for him to come out. You mentioned agriculture, one of his passions. He's been a regular visitor to the Royal Welsh Show, hasn't he? And yeah. also with the, the Duchess of Cornwall, as she was known then. Yeah, and, he, and, and it's also a, a non-controversial thing to get involved with in Wales as well. You'll notice that about the types of organisations he champions. He's not, um, he's not necessarily picking organisations, hasn't picked organisations the Prince of Wales, which which would lead to much controversy, but they are. Uh, he always picks those elements of Welsh life which are important. Uh, you know, Wales is a is a farming nation, is a very rural nation, uh, and for him to be able to not just support big organisations, big events like the Royal Welsh Show, but also to you know, take an interest in rare breeds of cattle and of sheep as well, um, and to support those through his organisations, um, that's where he has this really keen interest. And I think. You know, even just speaking to people um, about how he behaved when he was in Aberystwyth. He would go on holiday um, from Aberystwyth to places like the Glanusk Estate um, in South East Wales, where he could fish, he could relax in the countryside um, and not really be disturbed. William had a bit of that as well, so while he was in Anglesey, he was able to enjoy that privacy and to be able to go off walking. Um, and the Princess of Wales, as she is now, was able to go you know, shopping in the supermarket in Menai Bridge and find it maybe remarked upon by the locals, but you know, they weren't She was often taking spotted photos, in, in yeah. Waitrose in Menai Bridge. Yes. <laughs> um, but there is that sense of the sanctuary, right? That mm -hmm. Wales is a place they can come to and they've got that, um, that opportunity to you know, not necessarily blend in, but um, you know, especially if he's out in the countryside, he can enjoy, enjoy that. And in, in where his home is in West Wales, in rural Carmarthenshire, um, everybody knows him. They all know when he's there. A lot of them get invited round to the events that he has. Um, he's got this huge barn there where he will host people to have um, you know, drinks, but also they will sit down. Students from the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama will go up uh, and perform, perform skits for him and that sort of thing. We're waiting for Charles to come out, but there are pictures too of um, David Beckham actually in Westminster Hall. 
all at the moment where he's types of people yeah. queuing up to pay their respects to the Queen. Um, miles and miles of queues along the Thames, and we've seen uh, Tanny Gray Thompson, uh, one of Wales's um, most decorated Paralympians. She was there uh, just yesterday paying tribute. And people here today in Cardiff saying that they also intend to go to Westminster. So we've heard from people from Wales who've already um, gone up in order to view the Queen lying in state. And we expect more people from Wales to go there as well. And on the left of the screen, the King also heading out of the castle now with, uh, with the Queen Consort. A wave to the crowd as he does come out. And they are certainly pleased to see them. And we're expecting them to come and talk to members of the public for a few minutes now, Hugh. That will yes. be a, a special moment for them and one they'll never forget. Yeah, he did gesture. I think the Queen Consort is coming over first as the King shakes hands still at the bottom of the steps to the castle door. And plenty of people here, as is the image all the time, phones in the air to try and capture this moment for themselves as well. There's the King walking over accompanied by uh, Dr. Graham Davis on his left as well, who's his closest advisor on, on Welsh affairs, um, and speaking to the, uh, is it the conductor of the band there as well. Yeah, a sense of uh, anticipation. They've all gone very quiet here as they, they, as they wait for the king to come over. I think having seen the pictures of him well, elsewhere in Cardiff, Talking to the uh, goat sergeant major, and that goat is, uh, has his own title, Lance Corporal Schenken the Fourth, very popular member of yes. the regimental uh, band. Had a chance to meet some people there. I mean, a lot of people. They've, they've waited a long time. Not much else to do while they were here, other than to take in the occasion. They have been treated to some glorious Welsh sunshine the late morning and the early afternoon today. Yes, traditional Welsh weather. <laughs> which is <laughs> certainly helps certainly yeah it certainly helps today and he you know is is you know, smiling broadly everyone who is in here spent a long time waiting he's only going to meet the friendly faces in here certainly um and there are lots of them well chatting to some people who were queuing up outside earlier i, I spoke to people who couldn't make it to london so they decided to come to cardiff because they wanted to catch a glimpse of the new king yeah, there are, you know, there are children taken out of school to come and, and watch today. Um, there are people who've come here because it is an historic occasion. One of those famous red bucket hats for the Welsh football fans as well. Which are handy on a day like today for the rest of us catching the sun. still quite quiet here from the crowd. I think they're trying to listen in to see uh, what he's able to say as he goes along. A few Welsh flags there as well, being held up uh, just behind the front rows. And people wanted to greet the Prince, but also to sympathise with him and offer condolences. Uh, again, we spoke earlier to a member of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers who is queuing up, and of course the Queen was their Colonel in Chief. So people are here for two very different reasons. Absolutely, and I think you know, the, the, it's not celebration today, but it's welcoming the king. Um, it's marking his arrival here in Wales as king um, with these functions at the castle. Um, but certainly the mood is reflective and sombre, especially with the service in Llandaff Cathedral this morning. Cheers of God save the king then as you mentioned we can see union flags but also Welsh flags fluttering in the background. It's in the ancient well the historic Norman keep of the castle in the back of the picture there. And everybody lined up on the lawn in front. Very interesting history to Cardiff Castle from the Roman uh, original site in uh, 55 AD and that the Norman edition there from the 12th century and then obviously the Butte family taking over in uh, the 18th century yeah, turning sort of, it into a Victorian dream really. Yeah, the Victorian construction of it. The, um, the architecture is incredible here and the whole um, the atmosphere within the castle, within the city 
you know, Cardiff is a relatively small city. The castle is so dominant uh, at its heart. It's the fitting location today for the king to come in, you know, protected from the, the bustle of the outside, but um, in this very traditional and um, iconic setting for him to, to have not just the meetings inside people, to come out and meet the Welsh people here as well who will want to see him today. Well, let's hear from some of those uh, Welsh people who've come to greet him. Uh, my colleague, Charanpreet Kera, is uh, out amongst the crowd. Oh, I'm sorry, I can hear you. I'm in the middle of a very excited crowd. You can probably see the camera phones flashing behind me. There's just murmur of murmur of excitement after a murmur of excitement as King Charles III makes his way down this line, greeting people as he goes. Everybody craning their necks to try and catch a glimpse. Now I've got Angus with me here. Angus, you're a second year student. Yeah, right. What made you want to come along today? I mean, it, apart from the fact it's a massive day, the town was buzzing. We've been in town since 11. Came down, wandering around, had some breakfast, just watching the crowds gather. Um, it's a huge thing to be a part of, just to get a glimpse of him, really. I never got a chance to see the Queen, sadly. So my friends and, and I decided we had to be here, really. Um, big, part, big part of it, our culture and our country, especially, yeah. And it's pandemonium at the moment. Yeah, Everybody's kind of running around to try and follow the King on his movements. Yeah. What's the atmosphere been like today so far? Um, it's been quite intense. We haven't seen much of him. He arrived, went inside really briefly and then came back out. Um, and to have never seen the Queen, it's nice to be able to see the King however many days than we are now, five or six, yeah. um, and that close as well. So it's been a brilliant day so far. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now, guests have been coming to Cardiff Castle from all over the world for today's um, for today's uh, event. There have been 2,000 people in the castle so far. And I've already met a couple who travelled all the way from Switzerland. Over here I have Richard, and you've travelled all the way from America. From Boston. And what made you want to go so far? Well, we're um, in Marblehead, and I'm with a, um, a group that came on a tour of the gardens. We went in the north of England, Yorkshire, and Cumbria. And we have a friend who lives in Cheltenham, and we heard that the king was coming to Cardiff, and so we absolutely wanted to come to see him and see the tradition carry on. Well, it's fortuitous timing being in the country in such a historic moment. What's the atmosphere been like for you in Cardiff today? Oh, it's very festive, which, you know, given we've been experiencing the mourning period for the Queen, which is appropriate, it's been, as I said, nice to see the tradition now carrying on with the King and the flag raised full uh, when he arrived here. So, um, you know, very much appreciated being here at this moment. Sad at the beginning of the week, uh, the Queen's death occurred just as we arrived, uh, just following her meeting with Liz Truss, which is amazing in its own right for the continuity. So we wish uh, her, the Prime Minister, and the King, and the people all the best in this transition. That's absolutely brilliant. Kind wishes indeed. Thank you so much, Richard. And I think that just about sums it up. Mixed emotions here, mourning the Queen, but welcoming the new King on his first visit to Wales. Well, Charon Preet, thank you. Who, uh, as Charon Preet was pointing out there, people have come to Cardiff from all parts of the world to greet the new King. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, an opportunity to see him but it's also, you know, more importantly and more obviously for Welsh people to uh, to see him today. You can hear the three cheers going up. Uh, that's the second time that's happened since he's come out. He's got a lot of time here with people. Um, been, to be fair to them, have waited quite a while for this as well. So he's able to to at least give them some of that back. Um, and the the mood the mood today, as I say, it's been reflective. There is this kind of hint of celebration at least of wanting to mark the fact that he is now king, having had such a long relationship uh, with Wales before this moment. Um, and lots of people wanting to uh, see him 
and to convey their sympathy at the passing of his mother, but also to show their support for him as well. I mean, it's, part, it's the last stop of his tour of the nations of the UK this week. Um, and the significance of him you know, receiving that motion of condolence in the Senate today, receiving that in Welsh, but also underlying underlining his motto as Prince of Wales, which was Ich dien, I serve. And he said the Welsh phrase, uh, which, which conveys that same meaning, uh, which he has said has been you know, his guiding force as Prince of Wales and will continue as King as well. But certainly you would expect lots of these Welsh relationships uh, to carry on, even if he doesn't have uh, quite a, as much time as he used to have to be able to come to Wales and to, to meet people and to keep in touch. It has been a, a punishing schedule this week, as you mentioned, Wales is the last of the devolved nations uh, for him to visit this week. But he doesn't look tired at all, and no. he's relishing meeting these people. He looks energised. Yeah, he's incredibly hardworking anyway. I think you know, we see that when he does his, um, when he's been here for Wales Week, which is this, you know, a few days every year. He, it always looks like a punishing schedule. He does manage to take in so much during those visits. Um, he's used as well to the, you know, the geography of Wales. Um, he's come here by helicopter today. He's often jumping about the country when he's been in Wales uh, in order to get um, you know, from city centres to rural West Wales, where his home is as well um, and you know we don't know whether he's going to keep that home whether his visits will be as any anywhere near as frequent as they have been recently um, but we're seeing today the reaction from the public uh, to him uh, is incredibly warm and must surely be benefiting from you know the hard work he's put in as Prince of Wales uh, to really deepen that that relationship and that friendship that he has with with people here and Queen Consort Camilla also being very warmly received. Yeah, as she has been actually whenever she's been to Wales. Um, they're just getting into the car now to, to set off, but Camilla has been with him when we were in the Ronda earlier in the, in the week as well. And the Welsh National Anthem play now as they drive out. Another rousing rendition of Men of Harlech. Men of Harlech <laughs> as they march themselves out of Cardiff Castle as well. Um, yeah, certainly the, it, it needed to have all of that. Um, the ceremony, the red tunics, the hats, the, the musical instruments as well um, to, to mark that occasion. But um, yeah, the visit, the personal touch, the shaking hands, that goes an awful long way as well towards strengthening, maintaining that relationship that the King has with Wales. They'll be making their way now to Poncana Fields, where they will be taken out of Cardiff, out of Wales, by helicopter. Yeah, they'll leave and they'll head back to London uh, for more engagements today. And they're on uh, North Road heading out of Cardiff now, um, 
which is one of the main routes which will take them back towards um, the park where the helicopter uh, is waiting for them. And everything happening to time as well, because this visit had to uh, take in so many locations in one, one day, meet so many people, a few gear changes as well from the somber service this morning to you know, men of Harlech and the band playing as they leave Cardiff Castle to three cheers uh, as well. Uh, but certainly, the, I think the king and the palace would be happy with the reception that they had in Wales, but also that the king himself went quite far towards trying to neutralise that hint of animosity that there is about the Prince of Wales' title and about the role of the monarchy in a modern Wales and a Wales which is very different to when he first developed his relationship with the country in the late 1960s. I mean, you did mention earlier, Hugh, that small protest that did take place outside the castle grounds, a small protest and a peaceful protest. Yes, it was. And it was a voice that, um, voices that reflect the way a minority, but a vocal minority feel about um, the monarchy, and specifically about the title of Prince of Wales as well. I suspect, even though um, Charles referenced Llewellyn at Griffith, the last Welsh Prince of Wales in the Senedd today, uh, it's probably not going to neutralise uh, those uh, those people who want to protest against him today. And it is probably something that the new Prince of Wales, William, will have to try and get to grips with fairly quickly. We know actually that the Prince of Wales, William, spoke to uh, the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, earlier this week. The result of that conversation was an announcement that he would visit Wales very soon, uh, which is you know, diplomatic language for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a month or two. Um, but certainly the speed at which the continuation of the title was announced, um, you know, barely uh, 24 hours after the, the king um, had taken the throne, um, showed that there won't be a long period to wait for, you know, certainly for a new Prince of Wales, but also for that that work to begin and that role to take shape. Uh, we wait to see whether there will be any formal investiture ceremony um, at all, um, and if it will be anything on the scale of what happened in 1969. All the hints are that it won't be anything like that uh, because of the very political nature of, of, of that event. Um, and certainly comments this week that we've heard that the Prince of Wales, uh, the King rather, when he was Prince of Wales, had said privately uh, that he didn't want William to go through what he went through in the 1960s when that investiture uh, period was happening and everything that came before and after it. Um, but as they head out of Wales now, the King and the Queen Consort, I think they'll be pleased with the way that the day has gone here today um, and that they also managed not just to renew those connections with the organisations, the charities, the people, the politicians, um, but they hear the castle in the Cardiff Bay and in Llandaff Cathedral were able to meet the public who really did turn out in force for them as well. So all in all here, a successful day. Uh, it's been described by some in the crowd I was speaking to earlier as, as joyous. And as you said, uh, some gear changes, you know, that very moving service this morning. And we've seen all kinds of people from all walks of life in Wales, from the Archbishop and the First Minister to uh, all kinds of people from different backgrounds who've made it to the castle to, to speak to the King. Yeah, and, and wanting, to, wanting to come, wanting to share um, the moment with them, but also that they wanted to, to see the King and to be able to, to show their support for him at a time when the country uh, is mourning the loss of a Queen, but also is expecting uh, a new King and is wanting to encourage him and to show that support as well. He's certainly seen that here in Cardiff today. OK, Hugh, thank you very much. Well, uh, the King and the Queen Consort have left Cardiff Castle. They're making their way out of Wales and back to London. So let's head over to the Senedd in Cardiff Bay, where Lucy is waiting for us. 
Jennifer, thank you, and so lovely to hear your reflections there. And I think many people would agree it has been a successful day for King Charles. It is a stunningly beautiful day here in Cardiff, and while there has been sadness about the loss of the Queen, there is also that sense of anticipation and joy about the future and the reign of King Charles. This is the beating heart of modern democracy here at the Senate in Cardiff, and I don't think it can be overstated just how symbolic it felt to hear King Charles address those parliamentarians, not just in English, but in Welsh today. And when he said, the land of Wales could not have been closer to my mother's heart, she took immense pride in your many achievements and deeply felt with you in times of sorrow, and also said that it had been a privilege for all of these decades to be the Prince of Wales. Those are the words that people are talking about today, the words that he spoke just a few hours ago in the Senate. So we leave you from here in Cardiff to take you back to central London, to Westminster, where we can join my colleague Karen Giannone, who has been with the crowds, seeing those incredible queues, Karen, and a, a few special visitors as well there in the past few minutes. Yeah, there have been uh, special visitors, Lucy, which has certainly lightened the mood. Uh, I'll come to that in just a second. Uh, the people now coming through have been queuing now for over 12 hours. They really are the hard core of the queuers. Uh, many jokes around the world about how the British like to queue. This really is the queue to beat all queues. Look at that concentration just behind where we are speaking to you from here, where the concentration of people is at its densest. Just as you approach the Palace of Westminster, you are faced with this snake. Uh, it is about an hour and a half to get through there. Even though it is tantalizingly close to Westminster Hall, you have to go through this very condensed area. Uh, and uh, I mean, just in the shot you saw, you can see that the crowds across the Thames are snaking all the way along and over the bridge towards here, and they go back five miles to Southwark Park in the southeast of London. And the situation with the queue has not changed now for more than six hours. The government put out an advisory saying that the queue is at capacity, entry is currently poor. So even if you go to Southwark Park where the queue begins, you cannot get in, it is closed. So there is the prospect of a big queue for the queue Forming because people are obviously they were still on their way down after many hours of travel but the government advices do not attempt to join the queue until it resumes and keep checking back on the uh, the different live sites the live YouTube feed to see if uh, the queue reopens again but at the moment do not come there are too many people uh, and the queue is at complete capacity for now. But uh, these, although they may not feel that way after 12 hours of queuing, are the lucky ones. So, uh, And they were particularly lucky uh, earlier on. Imagine getting in the queue and realising that the bloke in front of you in a flat cap is actually David Beckham, who uh, joined the queue along with uh, the general public uh, at quarter to two this morning. And uh, he's just sort of slotted in there He's been talking about how he has really got to know the people around him. Uh, he has waited the whole time. There was some suspicion among other people in the queue that he may have skipped it as a celebrity, as a VIP, and somehow got to the front early. That was not the case. He has confirmed he joined the queue at 1.45 a.m. to uh, wait with everybody else. And uh, what, a, what a boost he has given to everyone. They've been taking selfies. Even the police and uh, the people taking all the rubbish here have been... Uh, really enjoying having a celebrity in their midst. And there you see him going in to Westminster Hall and uh, paying his respects to the Queen, and that's what he said he wanted to do. So uh, we have had a chance to have a word with him, and uh, he said that he'd been sharing sweets and snacks with everybody else, and that his knees were getting a bit achy when he was asked about uh, how he felt after queuing for more than 12 hours. Let's hear a little of what he had to say. To be honest, it, you know, it's, it's what we all envisioned, you know, we all want to be here together, we all want to experience something where we celebrate an amazing life with our Queen, uh, and I think, you know, something like this today is meant to be shared together, so, you know, the fact that we've been here, we're eating Pringles, we're eating <laughs> sherbet lemons, you know, we're eating sandwiches, having coffee, so donuts yeah, as well. Donut. We were very lucky, you know, we've, we've, we've been lucky as a nation to have someone that has led us the way Her Majesty has led us um, for
for, for the amount of time with kindness, with caring and, um, and always reassurance. I think that's the one thing that we all felt safe um, and we, we will continue that with the royal family but I think Her Majesty was someone special and, um, and, and will be missed not just by, by, by everyone in, in our country but um, everyone around the world. None other than, than David Beckham there in the queue with the tens of thousands of other people who have uh, stood, shuffled along, paused for hour after hour and then at points walked quite briskly. The queue keeps moving, although it has been stopped at its source and people continue to come to want to pay their respects to Her Majesty the Queen lying in state not far from here in Westminster Hall. From me, Karen Ginoni, here in Westminster, it's goodbye and goodbye to viewers on BBC One.